Good evening. Hi, everyone. My name is Robin Farber, and I'm the Assistant Director of Rentals, Operations, and Events here at Sixth and I. Whether you're here with us in person or watching virtually from home, on behalf of Sixth and I and our partners, Politics and Pros, thank you so much for being with us tonight and for your support of a nonprofit and independent bookstore. For those of you who may be new to Sixth and I, this building dates back to 1908. It was a synagogue for 45 years and then home to an AME church for the next 50. When the church relocated and put the building up for sale in the early 2000s, the highest bid was from someone who wanted to turn it into a nightclub. It was saved within 24 hours and for the past 19 years, Sixth and I has served as a center for arts, entertainment, ideas, and Jewish life. Our aim is to inspire more meaningful and fulfilling lives through an unexpected mix of experiences that embrace the multifaceted identities of those we serve. It's my honor to introduce award-winning author, musician, and screenwriter James McBride. In 2015, Mr. McBride was awarded the National Humanities Medal by President Obama for, quote, humanizing the complexities of discussing race in America. Mr. McBride has done this through his many works, including his landmark memoir, The Color of Water, a black man's tribute to his white mother, which has sold millions of copies since it was published in the mid-90s, the National Book Award-winning novel, The Good Lord Bird, about American abolitionist John Brown, the prize-winning novel, Deacon King Kong, an Oprah's book club selection, and Miracle at St. Anna, which was adapted into a film by Spike Lee. Tonight, Mr. McBride, who is a distinguished writer in residence at New York University, joins us on the occasion of the release of the Heaven and Earth Grocery Store. The novel is about small town secrets and the people who keep them. Set in a neighborhood where immigrant Jews and African Americans have long lived side by side. In a recent review the Heaven and Earth, of the Heaven and Earth Grocery Store, Washington Post book critic Ron Charles wrote, we all need, we all deserve this vibrant, love-affirming novel that bounds over any difference that claims to separate us. Tonight, James McBride will be in conversation with Jason Reynolds, who we are also so honored to have with us. A DC native, Mr. Reynolds is a number one New York Times best-selling author of many award-winning books, including Look Both Ways, All American Boys, written with Brendan Keeley, and Stamped, Racism, Anti-Racism, and You, written with Dr. Ibram X. Kendi. We have autographed copies of his books, Long Way Down, and Ain't Burned All the Bright, for sale tonight. A recipient of a Newbery Honor, a Prince Honor, an NAACP Image Award, and multiple Coretta Scott King Honors, Mr. Reynolds recently served as the National Ambassador for Young People's Literature. Later in the program, we'd love to hear your questions, and you'll be invited to line up at the standing microphone in either aisle. Thank you all again, both here and at home, for being with us tonight. Please help me give James McBride and Jason Reynolds a warm welcome to Sixth and I. Good evening, good evening, good evening. Everybody's okay? All right. I want to say before we get started, uh, a few really quick things. Number one, um, thank you to Six and I for having us. Uh, book events are always funny to me because, because the people who read these books always show up to the events very serious. <laughs> and the people who write these books are often not quite as serious. And so I hope we can kind of take the edge off a little bit. You'll see when he gets, I mean, this would be a good time. Uh, and, and secondly, let me just say to Mr. McBride, you know, I argue with my friends a lot about who we feel is at the top of the heap. You don't know this, but 
me and my buddies really argue about sort of like, all right, in the black, for black male writers specifically, right, who is, uh, who's that, who's on, on top uh, of our time or of this moment? And my pick is always James McBride. There's some other people in there, John Edgar Wideman, some other folks come up in it, but I'm like, I'm telling y'all, it's McBride, it's McBride, it's McBride, it's McBride, it's McBride. So I'm honored to have this moment for the second time uh, to share this with you this evening. Well, <clears throat> another happy customer. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we, because the book has just come out and we're, we're, we, some of you have read it, some of you have not, we figured we'd start with a little bit a little bit of a reading. Okay. And then we'll, we'll right. get into it all. Uh, this is from uh, the beginning of the book. Uh, this, is, this is actually from chapter one. It was entitled The Hurricane. There was an old Jew who lived at the site of the old synagogue up on Chicken Hill in the town of Pottstown, Pennsylvania. And when Pennsylvania state troopers found the skeleton at the bottom of an old well off Hay Street, the old Jew's house was the first place they went to. This was in June 1972, the day after the developer tore up the Hay Street lot to make way for a new townhouse development. We found a belt buckle and a pendant in the well, the cop said, and some old threads from a red costume or jacket. That's what the lab shows. They produced a piece of jewelry, handed it to him, and asked it what, what it was. A mezuzah, the old man said. It matches the one on the door, the cop said. Don't these things belong on doors? The old man shrugged. Jewish life is portable, he said. The inscription on the back says, home of the greatest dancer in the world. It's in Hebrew. You speak Hebrew? Do I look like I speak Swahili, the old man said. Answer the question, do you speak Hebrew or not? I bang my head against it sometimes. And you're Malachi the dancer, right? That's what they say around here. They say you're a great dancer. Used to be. I gave that up 40 years ago. Then what about the mezuzah? It matches the one here. Wasn't this the Jewish temple? It was. Well, who owns it now? Who owns everything around here, the old man said. He nodded at the immense gleaming private school seen, seen through the dim window, the Tucker School. It sat proudly atop the hill behind wrought iron gates with smooth lawns, tennis courts, and shiny classroom buildings, a monstrous bastion bastion of arrogant elegance, glowing like a phoenix above the ramshackle neighborhood of Chicken Hill. They've been trying to buy me out for 30 years, the old man said. He grinned at the cops, but he was practically toothless, save for a single yellow tooth that hung like a clump of butter from his top gum, which made him look like an aardvark. You're a suspect, they said. Suspect, suspect, he said with a smile. He was well north of 80, wearing an old gray vest, a rumpled white shirt holding several old pens in the vest pocket, a wrinkled towel around his shoulders, and equally rumpled old pants. But he reached, when he reached inside his pants pocket, his gnarled hands moved with such deftness and speed that the state troopers, who spent most days ticketing tractor trailers on nearby Interstate 76 and impressing, impressing pretty housewives during traffic stops, with their bubblegum lights and stern lectures about public safety, panicked and stepped back, their hands on their weapons. But the old man produced nothing more than several pens. He offered the cops one. No thanks, they said. They milled around for a while longer and eventually left, promising to return after they pulled the skeleton out of the well and studied the potential murder scene some more. They never did, though, because the next day, God wrapped his hands around Chicken Hill and wrung his last bit of justice out of that wretched place. So that's how the book begins. Should we, should we give a little bit of context, a little bit of background, or an overview <coughs> without well, spoiling? I guess y'all ain't read it, right? Some of you, some of you haven't? None of you have. Shame for shame for well, shame. Well, the book just came out. Like the day, doesn't yeah. matter. The day of speed reading is over. <laughs> All right, so let's give a little context. <laughs> Well, the book is really about equality, and um, the, book, the, the book is bookended by events in 1972, but it jumps back to 1930-35, when a Jewish theater owner named Moshe Ludlow, um, he, he meets a woman named Chona, and, and he falls in love, and he gets married, and he has, she runs a grocery store called the Heaven Earth Grocery Store, which is located in Chicken Hill in Pottstown, Pennsylvania, which is where the blacks and Jews and other people who couldn't afford to live any better lived. 
And um, during this time, this Jewish couple, particularly Chona, uh, finds herself in a scenario where she is, uh, she ends up taking in a deaf 12-year-old black kid that the state of Pennsylvania is trying to get a hold of. Um, her resistance, which is coupled with the resistance of the surrounding black community, uh, is, the, is really the nub of the book. Um, the, the, the central character of this book and the central meaning of this book in terms of equality is really about disabled children and about how these two communities, this black Jew and Jewish community, these two, there's been a lot said about black Jewish life and much of it is negative. This is not about the negative part. This is about people who see the humanity in each other and decide because Chona is disabled, she has polio, this little boy is disabled, he's deaf, and some of the people who play at Moshi's nightclub, like, you know, um, and, uh, um, Chick Webb and others, disability runs through this book. And I'll explain why I decided to write this book as we have a chat. But so essentially the, the conflict in the book is that the state wants this kid and they're going to go into Chicken Hill and take him. And the resistance is really where the plot sort of just rolls along. I always am, am interested um, in environment. I think, um, you know, I've I read all your books over the years and I think you, there's always sort of this, the smorgasbord of characters and so much is happening between the human beings that they are, but it's always up against the environment in which they live. And so I guess my, my, my question is, it, explain Chicken Hill, the character. Because Chicken Hill feels like a part of, Chicken Hill is breathing in the story to me. Well, community is important in any book, in real life and in any book. And in, in Pennsylvania, and all across the country, this country, you know, this, this idea of a small town being a place like Mayberry where it was just white people, no Jews, no Italians, not, no blacks, you know, and they, you know, <laughs> you know, all that stuff. I mean, it's great television, but it's not really the reality. And, um, I've never whistled. Well, <laughs> I have a brother like you. If you whistle, he'll punch you in the face. But um, I wanted to create, I wanted to show, you know, what this world was really like, you know, because it's, it's, this is a community I know. My grandmother, my grandparents, you know, my, my mother was from Suffolk and she was Jewish and my mother, my grandmother ran a store and she, she lived a very unhappy life and I wanted, I put, she wasn't loved in her life so I put her on the page and I made her loved. And um, this town, this part of town where these, these people lived had its own life. It, had, it, it brought its own vibrancy. Um, similar to all the books I've written, uh, there's always community because community is where people are and the writer has to go where the people are. And in this case, the people had the stories about, you know, immigrant Jews from the old country not knowing what to keep and what to leave behind, African Americans who came up from the South who also are as disparate that the African Americans who really want to be part of the American thing and then you had the people from the low country, the Gullah people who had no, no interest in it whatsoever. And they're all knotted in this whole business of this kid who's taken to, you know, an insane asylum and they've, they've got to break him out. And so they have to discard a lot of their differences in order to deal with this problem. And in doing so, we get a chance to see the humanity of people, sure. which is really what, what it's all about. Sure. I, I, you know, I firmly believe that uh, the common denominator, our great, the, the great equalizer is our love for children. Right. The idea, hopefully, right now we know that children are often used as pawns, which is a whole other conversation. But I, I'd like to believe that despite all of our differences, when it comes down to the, to the, to the innocent and the most human amongst us, which are the children, uh, we, we, we can at least see a little more eye to eye. And I think you do a wonderful job at, at showing that. And before I get more into that, I want to talk a bit about music and that, and we all know you as a musician. I actually think you like the Deion Sanders of of this thing, you know, you know, it's like, you're like the only person who's ever done it like this, who's like been at the top of both things, you know. Uh, for those who don't know, well, I, the, the, the reading crowd, you know, do y'all know who Deion Sanders is? Do y'all know why this is an important statement? A bunch of liars, you know what I mean? 
<laughs> Deion Sanders was great at both football and baseball at the same time. He played both professional sports. As we know, Mr. McBride here is you know, a man of many, many, many talents uh, as, as an incredible musician and also, as you all know, an incredible writer. And I think the two bleed into one another. To me, your writing feels like jazz. To me, it all feels very musical. Um, it almost seems like, and, and it's interesting because my editor has, has edited me out of this, and I'm, I get so angry when I read your books, I'm like, well, James McBride can do this. I just don't know why I can't try to do this, right? This idea that we can start at the one, and then we can just kind of, we can just sort of do our thing for a while, and eventually we'll come back to the one, and it'll all make sense, and it's all sort of intentional, right? Or that we can have all these instruments playing at the same time, and, and, if, and if you're a good enough musician, or if you're a good enough composer, they'll all be sort of working with one another, even if they feel disparate, right? But they all are kind of a part of the same song. And I think you have a, it almost feels like an innate knack to do this. Whereas I sometimes read your work and I'm like, do I really need to know all this about a character? And well, that's, I realize <clears throat> I do need to know all this about this character. Well, th that's really, that's the rub. I mean, the trick really is to, to know that you're really not that free. I mean, if you're playing in the key of B flat, and you, and, you know, jazz, you state the melody, and then, the, you know, you solo, and you go back to the melody. Mm -hmm. If you're playing the key of B flat, and you play a G sharp, you better have a good excuse for it, or, or be Charlie Parker. You know, you just, you have to know, you, and you really don't play everything you know. Um, and in writing, you don't write everything you write. You just write enough to, to, to at least trick, or have the reader believe you really know a lot about that. When in fact, you really don't. You just know enough just to give them the cake icing or the, you know, the, like the bone of it. And they say, oh, well, if I see the bone, the steak is there. If, if, if this were a jazz song, what jazz song would it be? If this moment were a jazz song? If this book. Oh, well, this would be a Duke Ellington kind of song because Duke Ellington, went, like the Basie band, you know, if you ever saw the Basie band, though many of you haven't, I'm so, some of the older people, you know, the Basie band was like one big note, like pop. But Duke, you know, Duke would start his band and then he'd just point to, you know, Harry Carney and say, okay, go ahead. And he, and he would just, because Duke had a band of soloists. And so this book has many characters. And so each character I had to, I won't say stop, I had to figure out how to lay in backstory on that character while keeping the plot moving. And most importantly, not imposing my own opinions about that person. And that's the hard part. I think that that's where writers make a mistake. Mm. Because if you show people what it is and, let, and trust them to decide what they see, then they will, they'll come to their own conclusions, but they'll, at least they know you were being honest. Mm. Um, and so the, the difficulty is that when writers can write, they tend to just get into story and then they just, they just drive home the, the point that they're right. And, it's, you know, when I, I read The Perfect Storm, you know, and, and this guy's a good writer. It's a nonfiction book. And by the way, my philosophy about writing and about anything is if you can't say the stuff with the person in the same room, you probably shouldn't say it. But in my opinion, Perfect Storm, you know, showing how this guy dies and then the water goes into his lungs and his lungs burst. And it, I mean, you know, you had me at hello. You dig? I mean, you know, the guy's dead. It's done. Move on now. Because he's got a family. He's reading that. I mean, he's nonfiction. In fiction, it's the same thing. You can't fall in love with your words. You have to fall in love with your ideas. Once the idea is communicated, you know, the house is green, comma, go. Toni Morrison can drop into it. You know, she can, she's like Nina Simone. You know, she, she, she can just, if you ever hear a recording of Nina Simone doing good bait, you'll hear I mean, she, she was just a genius. Toni Morrison could do that. You know, William Faulkner could do that. But you and I, you know, we can't fly from block to, but we got to wait for the bus. You're right. <laughs> You're right about that. <laughs> got to know yourself, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Let, let's talk a bit. Of, I, so, so that there's, to me, there, having read this book, and there, I want to get to Dodo, but before I get to Dodo, I, I can't, there are some relationships in the book that I feel that are, um, that sing in a different way, that feel, that feel sacred, that feel special. Uh, the first is the relationship between Moshe and his wife, Shona. I, 
as a mama's boy, as a, as a boy who was raised with a very strong, in a household with a very strong woman, and a bunch of her sisters who were all strong women, and a sister who was a strong woman, um, I, I, I got like a, when, maybe one of my favorite characters ever, like maybe, like maybe in my like pantheon of just some of the greatest, one of the greatest characters because she, and their relationship, right? Because it, to, for me, I grew up in a household where it's like, yeah, women run the house. I, I leave the house and I hear propaganda that says men run the house. And I'm always like, I've never, never seen that. I don't know, I've never seen it. Right, like my mother ran the house. Didn't matter what my father said, my mother was the one who made the decisions and my father was like, this is what we're doing because your mother said this is what we're doing. And in this relationship, it's very similar. It's like, no, I'm, she's strong and she's confident and she's intentional and his reactions to her are not reactions based in fear, they're reactions based in love. Well, <clears throat> most she respected his wife. She was more religious than him, for one. She was an American, born and raised, you know, in the United States. That was another thing. You know, she was disabled, but her disability was actually her strength, one of her strengths. And also she came, and she's based on the real life, you know, you know the real life women of that time who became the progressive Jews like Emma Goldman and Bell Moskowitz and some of these women that most people don't really know that much about or, or I mean I'm sure some in the audience knows, know these names but she was a person who really understood how to use the limited power that she had and she was also someone who picked him off the ground when he wasn't you know when he was when he was you know flat out and so and she wasn't afraid of other people who were different than her which made her unique because she, you know, she ran a store in the black community and her husband said, we've got to move, and she refused to. You know, she'd say, well, the postman knows where I live, and you know, he'd say, let's move where the Americans are, and she'd say, which Americans? And that used to really make him mad. But um, that's how society changes. You, you start right where you are. You know, that's, what, that's why Chona is so important uh, in this book, and, and the Chonas of the world in real life are important as well. There's also a level of resilience. Y'all hear that? I don't know what it is. Like, I don't. There's also a level of resilience. Well, there's a lot of resilience in her. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a moment where I, we, you know, where I thought she was going to die. Right. And I'm like, please don't die. Right. And then not only does she not die, but, and this is not spoiling anything. Not only, not only does she not die, but then, but then she goes and protects someone who, whose life really is in danger. Right. right? But this, this little, this young, deaf, black boy. Uh, and, and this character, Dodo, whose name is Dodo, this character is when the entire story sort of takes a shift. Now, before we get into Dodo, I want to ask some questions about naming. I, if anyone's ever read a James McBride book, if this is your first book, well, you're in, you're in for a treat. But if you read any of his other works, if you read Dick and King Kong, if you read Galore Bird, if you read any of the other stuff, and he's got a, there's a thing about the names, right? There's a lot of names. There's a lot of nicknames. There's <laughs> <laughs> everybody's got like a, you know, everybody's name sounds like either, like either a gangster or who you would imagine a jazz musician would be, right? It's like... And so I guess my question is, where do the names come from? Are, are these names that live with you? Are these names of people you know? Because I steal all my friends' nicknames. Are, even thinking about the naming of, of the grocery store itself. Well, <clears throat> what I do is when I write a book, I, I draw a big circle on a piece of paper. Like a big, you know, like a, one of those artist easel papers. And I, I write down a bunch of names. I mean, I start with a character. Like this book actually, you know, began as a book about a camp for disabled kids that I worked at, and I can explain that in a minute. But in any right. case, when I, when I realized that the book really should begin with Moshi, I, got, I found a Moshi in my mind, in my imagination. And then I just started to, you know, who would, who would he meet and who would she be? And, you know, and then the names just, you know, you, you, you research names, you, you throw them up and then you juggle them around and you... And you say, what, what does the name represent? What does it mean? Um, and, then, and then you get into like, you know, our names are nothing but a jumble of letters. You know, you could just as soon call me, you know, 
corn, you know, corn, you know, corn toe, you know, fingernail. I mean, it, what this doesn't make, it, it's, it's just all, so ultimately, you know, the, the, what happens is, you know, it's in the air. And, um, and it, it sort of, it just becomes part of the character. I, I, I can't explain it. It's just, I used to know a lot of people with crazy names. I'm sure you did as well in Africa, in black America, man, I mean, every, yeah, 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 everybody. So, I mean, um, it, they, they just, I spent a lot of time on learning who these characters are. I used to write little short bios of characters. I don't do that. I don't need to do that anymore. But I spent a lot of time thinking about them. And I'll rename them. Like when I work with, you know, a film director, he would just name, he'd say, ah, call him that. And that would be it. And I'd say, well, you can't just, you know, I'd say to myself, you know, you can't, you know. <laughs> and I'd say, okay, whatever. But me, I take a long time. Because when I put that name on that circle, I do it in pencil. And I connect, the, you know, this character's going to connect. This has to, she has to connect to her. He has to connect. And then... If it doesn't work, you know, I'd scratch them out and then I'd put another piece on. And then when I start inking them with, you know, ma Magic Marker, then I know they're solid. Yeah, that's how it feels, I think. You know, what's that game with the numbers? You know that game with the boxes and the numbers? Sudoku, that's what it feels. When I read the books, I'm like, this is like human, human Sudoku, right? All of the sort of characters are, are meeting up in the most interesting ways, everybody's story. Like, I think, to me, you write about, to me, me how I personally, as I project my feelings onto your work, <laughs> I, I believe all of your books are about the interconnectedness of humanity. I personally believe that these are books about, about fabric, about how humanity is really just a, 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 a threaded experience. We just don't talk long enough to figure out which threads connect to which person, right? But that, that if you and I spoke for longer than an hour, I'm sure we know somebody between us really well. Right. And if me and any other stranger in here spoke for it for longer than an hour, I'm sure no matter where you come from or how different we are, we probably have one person in common, which means the degrees of separation are probably one or two and not six. We just don't communicate long enough to figure that out. And to me, your work always feels like an examination of human connectivity in all of these really interesting ways, for better or for worse, right? Like for, in all these kind of weird ways. I want to I wanna jump... I'll, can you please explain where Dodo comes from in real life? Okay, in real life, when I was, I was, a, when I was at Oberlin, my mother moved from New York to Philly. Thank you, Oberlin. I, Philly, you know. <laughs> Oberlin, Dominus <laughs> Owens. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm very grateful to Oberlin, you know, the first school to uh, you know, admit women and blacks and so forth. When I came home from school that first year, I couldn't, I, my mother moved to Philly and I grew up in New York. I didn't know anybody in Philly. So I went to get a job and it was an ad in the paper, said, you know, dishwasher at a camp, sleepaway camp, which was good because I didn't want to stay at my mother's house. You know, she lived in the hood and she was, you know, she was always hassling me anyway. I'm going to get out of here. <laughs> so I, at this, I went to this guy's office. It was an old Jewish guy. His name was Bill Saltzman. And, I was, and he was talking to me, and after we, he talked a few minutes, talked a little while, he asked me a few questions, and he said, you're too smart to be a dishwasher. And he got on the phone and he said, Cy, Cy, I have a boy here, he's just too smart to be a dishwasher. You've got to make him a counselor. You know? And then he sent me to see Cy. <laughs> so I went to see Cy, and Cy said, the first thing Cy said, he said, look, I want to apologize, you know, for Bill using the term boy, you know, you're a young man, and, I, I didn't care. I wanted to, I, look, I don't care what you call me. So as long as you don't call me late for dinner, I'm good. But, so he gave me the job, and I, it was at a camp for handicapped kids called the disabled kids, so-called disabled kids. It was called the Variety Club Camp for Handicapped Children. And the, the history of it was the land was donated by a Romanian theater owner, Jewish guy. And um, it changed my life, you know. Cy Friend was, uh, he, was he changed... First of all, his, his staff would look like the United Nations. Big, big football players, black guys. It didn't matter. If you liked the kids, Cy would hire you. If you didn't like the kids, you didn't last there very long. And he just, he, and he was, you know, he was gay. He had to hide it. You know, we all knew it. But, you know, and he had to keep that secret all the time. All of, so four summers I was there and beyond. And he worked there most of his adult life. And really, the lessons that I learned from the children there stayed with me 
until now. And I always wanted to write a book about it. I met Dodo. Dodo was, in my, he was one of my eight kids. I had like two or three deaf kids. And their disabilities were all types. And if Cy ran that camp today, they'd put him in jail. Because we used to go on hikes on the road. We'd go on the highways. We'd play baseball. You know, you'd have kids that, who, who had cerebral palsy pushing other kids who had no legs. And they would carry them. They would leap off. The, I mean, they just had the freedom they never had. No air conditioning was allowed. He said they had no air conditioning there inside all year. And every night when they played, and he played that scratchy, you know, taps, if you stood in front of those cabins, you could almost hear those 91 kids say, you know, good night, he'd say, good night, boys and girls, and they'd say, good night, Uncle Cy. And I always wanted to write that book. I started to write that book, but it was, just wasn't a good book. It was the camp, and the kids wake up, and but the, the only thing that seemed to work in all those chapters were about the guy who donated the land for the camp, who in this case is Moshi. So I discarded all that stuff, just threw it out, and started with Moshi. And so I, ba- I ended up, the book evolved into a different kind of book, but the bone of the book really is about the friendship between Dodo and the kid he meets when he gets... By the way, and that's not a spoiler, Dodo is going to be fine, but he meets a kid when he gets institutionalized, named Monkey Pants. And really, really, the reason why I mention that to the audience is because those of us who have, have had experience with disabled people, what we don't understand is that they have, they discard a lot of this nonsense that we deal with. They don't even bother with white, black, Jewish, Italian, Muslim, they don't bother with, they just deal with the stuff, are the kidneys pumping? And they just deal with, and they have a thousand emotions inside them that you just don't see, but it's all there. They can be a pain, to, they're kids, they can be a pain to deal with. But what they give you, there's a special heaven for them. And I wanted to communicate that. And so that's really where the heaven and earth grocery store was born. The idea that, you know, there is a special heaven in place for these children who show us how to live. And Cy Friend, you know, this Jewish gay guy, showed that to me and to every counselor there, there at that camp. And, but I couldn't communicate it as a camp book. That's how the novel I, I, anyone who knows me knows I'll probably go ahead and write the camp book for him. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'll, figure, I'll figure it out for you. You know, <laughs> I, uh, I I think you. I think that so many of us have a hard time writing children. Uh, strangely, because everyone was a child, but I don't think that as we age, I don't think that we quite respect them the same, and therefore I think we, um, I think we turn them into symbols and caricatures and avatars in, in our books. And so I, Dodo to me is, 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 is an incredible rendering of, 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 of any child, let alone a child who has a disability. And his relationship with his friend, whose name you threw out there so cavalierly as if any of them would understand what you, his friend's name is Monkey Pants. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and one of the... What, to me, one of the, the other relationships that are so, that's, that's so incredible in the book and so vivid and so rich uh, and so musical uh, is the relationship between Dodo and Monkey Pants. Can you, can you just talk a bit about, and we, I can't, it's, here's the hard part about these kinds of events is that I can't tell you too much because I can't spoil the story. He can, though, because right? <laughs> it's his book, right? So. <laughs> well, the important thing to remember about Monkey Pants is that Monkey Pants has cerebral palsy what they call cerebral palsy, you know, what they used to call, I don't know what they call it now. And I th- we had a lot of cerebral palsy kids at Variety Club camp. And cerebral palsy people will really fool you. Now, when I say cerebral palsy, I know I'm talking about other things. But when you're talking about someone who has a disability where they're somehow, they can't communicate quite right, or their arms a little bit, or they walk funny, or, you know, you just assume that, you know, they're not either not intelligent or you have to hold the door for them or, you know, you're missing out because they got all of that. They got you pegged instantly the minute you walk in and they know your heart right away. Like the moment you fall in love, you say, oh, wow, I, I know what they Well, they know you right away because they've been watching you. They spend their life watching you. They spend their life watching you walk past them and think they don't know. So monkey pants, even though he, Dodo is deaf and monkey can't, pants can't, 
communicate because he has a speech disability, they find a way to communicate. And I witnessed that. You know, I witnessed that myself. Um, you know, I remember when there's a story when Joe Frazier came to Variety Club camp, you know, the heavyweight champ. And one of the kids, one of the cerebral palsy kids went up to him and said, you know, he said, Joe Frazier said, I can kick your ass. <laughs> 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 and you just like, you just had to be there, you know. <laughs> so I wanted to communicate what those two kids give us is the humanity that explodes all over the book. You know, it covers the, the whole the whole story, really. Yeah, yeah, they, they really do. They're like the anchor of the story. I, had a, I have a good friend of mine who has cerebral palsy. Uh, and I, you know, like you were saying a few, a few moments ago about how folks who, have, who live with disabilities, the things that they're concerned about are, are not what most of us, especially young people, are not what we're concerned about, all of the sort of minutia of, of ignorance and nonsense and all of the, the bickering and the fighting over the details of our lives that they're looking at like, what are you even, you got right. it all wrong. And my buddy, one day I asked her, I was like, what is it like you're a black woman in the world, you're dealing with this, being a black woman in the world, right? And she's like, man, I'm trying to figure out how to speak well enough for people to even understand what I'm saying. Yeah. Right, I'm con you're, you're concerned about sort of my, my skin and, and like what it is for my, my sex and gender, right? All these things which do matter in, in life, but, but, but like you're speaking from a, from a perspective that is so privileged that you don't even know it. Right. Because I'm trying to figure out how to do the small thing, which is a big thing in my life, which is communicate effectively right. so that I can get basic things done, right? And I think it's such a thing that we, we really uh, uh, underestimate. Um, and, and it was so lovely to just see their relationship and see it all play out in the story. That's the, when, you, when you all read the book, and the way he sets it up, I, I, I'm trying very hard not to give it all away, but the way he sets it up, it's going to be, um, you know, how he was talking about Duke Ellington or, or Basie, right? Like the, I, to me, it feels like that, more like that, that, that Basie, where it's like, where, where, where that, that when, when we finally get there, it's like a jolt. It feels catalytic, that part. Well, <clears throat> it's hard to write about mental and physical disability in, in this country because, especially during that period, because any child who had a disability and didn't look right or didn't have the right, you know, a doctor could just write a note, or write a letter and send the child to a mental institution and they'd be there for the rest of their lives. And that's not, I mean, that's not even, I'm not stretching the truth at all when I talk about that. So um, that created so much hardship for so many families for so many years. And listen, my niece, who was 28 when she passed away, was severely disabled. And my sister had the most difficult time finding help for her because, you know, now that said, there were hundreds, you know, when I did the research for this book, I, I spent a lot of time at Norristown State Hospital in Pennsylvania, and I met many, many really fine professionals who spent their entire lives, you know, trying to make things right for, or to, 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 to even out matters for the so-called disabled. Um, but I think the, the problem really is that we have so many stupid racial and cultural disparities that we pay attention to in this society that we don't really pay attention to the whole business of that we are together and we should love each other. It's real simple. It's not real complicated, you know. I wanted to talk about, you know, in this book, I was always been interested in Jewish history because my own history. I wanted to, even Jewish people, young Jewish people, have no idea how difficult life was for Jewish people when they came to this country in the 20s and 30s. I mean, I remember when I'm... In, you know, in Suffolk, Virginia, when I interviewed not only just my mother, but people who lived, Jews who lived in Suffolk, they'd say there were signs, no, no niggers, no dogs, no Jews. Big deal. That's it. I remember Charles Strauss, who wrote the Hanny, Charles Strauss, not Charles, Charles, not Charles Schultz. Who wrote Annie? Annie, the musical. Come on. Charles Schultz. Not Charles Schultz. He wrote that's, Peanuts. That's peanuts. <laughs> no, Charles Strauss. Am I in Washington, D.C.? Nobody knows who wrote Annie? Well, I, I knew Charles. I can't remember his last name because I'm getting old. But Charles told me one time when he was in the South, he was touring with a black singer, and they were in the South, and, the, and they went to a, a place to get something to eat, and the guy wouldn't, the guy wouldn't uh, 
he, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't serve the, 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 the singer. He said she was a fabulous singer. So Charles said, well, I'm not going to eat here either. And the guy, spit. <laughs> I, I to, I'm, so I'm not laughing, but Charles was laughing when he said, he said the guy spit on me. He said, he said he spit on me. He said a big tobacco white. He said, he said, I had a nice, clean white shirt. And he said, I still remember the, the dribble running down. <laughs> but, but that's what life was in the South for the Jews, you know. 30s and 40s it's just so I wanted to explore that as well and thankfully um, thankfully this experience at the camp gave me that opportunity to do that through these two boys yeah. and also to explore the whole business of how blacks felt about all this and that's something that you know that is almost never discussed you know, I remember Louis Armstrong talking about when he, you know, Louis Armstrong wore a Star of David around his chest all his life. It was given to him by the store owners that he worked with when he was a kid in New Orleans. And he remembered the kindness of this Jewish family. And most of my life growing up in New York, most of the teachers that I had were Jewish. See, the people who came, the immigrants, their children became teachers and so they didn't go into business and all that they didn't want it that was not you know it was may educate yourself so my my experience with the jewish world and some of it was negative but most of it was very positive with that you know to come along you're supposed to help heal the world so you know i never i never i don't see that very much in the dialogue or the life of black and Jewish writers and it might be because you know I, I mean because I'm not reading enough but there was a certain sense of togetherness in the even when I went to visit my mother's hometown and talk to the black people who knew my grandmother and my, and my mother they said you know well Mrs. Shilsky she was always very nice if you needed something, she would, you know, she'd help you out. You'd slip you a vegetable or something. She was, always, she was the nice one. It was the father who was the mean one. Hmm. And I hope that he just drops dead somewhere. They got a special hell for the kind of, you know what I mean? But so what story do you want to tell? Do you want to tell a story? You can make a lot of money in this country by just talking about the differences. You know, we, we see that now. You, make, you can become a multi, you can become very rich, but... That's not how democracy works. Democracy works when people say, well, you know, he's different than me, but I like him. She's different than me. She goes to church on Saturday. So how's it hurting me? It's not hurting me. If she's available Monday. Let's have coffee Monday then. Done. So that's where my books live. And, um, and I think that's what's the most, that's, why, why, why write about anything else? Does it scare you? Because there are a lot of writers these days that are terrified to write anything that might push against whatever the quo is, right? And the quo at this point is, is anger, right? The quo is, uh, is um, you know, this idea, I hate the word tribalism, but like the ideas around tribalism and like, you know, we are our folks, you stick over here to your people in your corner, you stick over here to people in your corner, and I'm gonna write a story about why these corners exist and why they should continue to exist while I throw stones to your corner you throw stones to my corner and everyone's terrified so I mean I'll tell you the truth man I don't know like you are uh, you exist in the world as somebody who, who you're a black man in the world who is also half Jewish mm -hmm. and I wonder if because you are half Jewish if you will avoid and escape all of the nonsense that so many people might face depending upon like these books get really complicated now right like a person could make a piece of art and, and we all in the room know how this we all i'm not saying anything that we all don't know right we know how this goes right whether no matter what the topic is in the same way like you being you being you're, you're, you being half black somebody's like oh well i'm not going to criticize him because at least he knows that experience or i'm not going to critique him because at least he knows that side of the experience well well that, that, that knife cuts both ways. I mean, I've had Jewish people say, how dare you, you know, you, you don't understand what it's like to be Jewish. Well, let me say, if you can find two Jewish people who agree about anything, I'll give you $100 right now. <laughs> so the, so I don't, that doesn't bother me. I mean, the problem really is it's a lack of respect and lack of understanding, a lack of history. Most Americans have no idea what Jewish history is. And frankly, 
Too many Jews don't know that much either. Not the young, young Jews don't know. I mean, they, they, you know, they go to, they go to temple, they go to yeshiva or something, they learn a little something, they forget about it, and they move on. Similarly, black kids have no, many black children have no idea of how, we were just talking about what D.C. is like now, have no idea of what, you know, what wonderful culture existed before it became hip to walk around with your pants down and talking about shooting the shit out of somebody. Excuse my language, though, sorry. You know, I mean, they really, so... What part of culture do you want to keep and what part do you want to discard and how to learn to respect other people who might not be like you but who want the same thing? I mean, I've been around the world. I've been all over this world. People want the same thing. They want to be happy. They want family. They want love. They want the children to be happy. So I think, I think it's dynamite for an uninformed person of color or anyone else to venture into t- talking about Jewish life when they don't know what they're talking about. Because Jewish people are very, very sensitive about anti-Semitism. The way you and I are very sensitive about being stopped by the cops at 2 o'clock in the morning. And so if you don't know what you're talking about, you probably shouldn't say nothing. But if you have the experience I've had, and I had no Jewish experience growing up other than I was raised by a mother who I didn't know was Jewish, but she would spank you at the moment. I mean, she, that belt was thunder and lightning. And you went to school and you went to church and you, you know, you knew who Jesus was. And if you you didn't go to church, you was going to go until you were too old to resist. What I learned was that despite all the hard, despite how hard my mother was on the outside, she was a very kind and very humorous person who knew how to laugh and knew what was important. And so the painful things she kept from me. Now, some of that stuff she kept from me, she shouldn't have done that. But I learned it on my own. And when I learned that I was big enough to appreciate what she was trying to, to, um, to keep me from. Similarly, I also learned that there was a lot of pain and suffering in her life that she just had to get away from. But when I went to look at her life, I wasn't looking at it from the point of pain and suffering. I was looking at it from the point of like, this is really fascinating and it's new and it's a part of me that I need. I need to take the best parts of it and use it for myself. But at this point in my life, I am not one of those Christians that runs around and says, you know, Jesus, is, and just because the preacher said, I'm not interested in that. And just because the rabbi intoned something, I'm not interested in that either. I'm interested in whoever is doing the right thing for the world. I'm in that. That's my religion. That's who I go with. I take that. That said, I, I, I do respect the cultural differences. I do respect the cultural riches of, of people who are different than me. And I find that, you know, Jewish people are funny. Now, I don't want to get, you know, I don't want to insult them because if, say, I say Jewish people are funny. Well, Irish people are funny. See, I mean, yes. of course, Italians are ha ha. You know, they're all funny. But Jewish humor is really good, you know. <laughs> and, you know, as a writer, you have to take it. Now, we know black folks are funny. Of course. So there was, I like, you know, I, I like to, I like to fun because humor helps us, helps us get along. Yeah. I, I, I have time for more. I, for one more question, so if you all have questions, which I hope you do, uh, then please feel free to line up at the microphones right here and here. Uh, if you don't have questions, what did you come for? Uh, <laughs> and I, I, I don't wait till the end to get your book signed, and then you're like, real quick, Mr. McBride, I got one quick question for you. <laughs> he doesn't have time, all right? Uh, my, my last question, you know, you don't remember this, I'm sure, but you said something to me the last time we talked that I remember, and that I think about often. Uh, so be careful what you say to people, because some of us remember. <laughs> uh, you said, uh, we were talking about skepticism. And you said, you said, young man, skepticism is good. Nothing wrong with being skeptical. Cynicism is dangerous. And I guess I, as, we, as we get ready to open it up for Q&A, though no one is lining up and is concerning me, uh, come, come line up to get, come to the microphone. Come line up to the microphone. It's all good. You know what I mean? We want to see your faces. Um, but as we, as we get ready to turn it over, um, all of your books, and this is something that so many of my other friends, so many of my friends who work in the lit fix space and who are writing all these incredible sort of very heavy books and, 
and they always are like, man, Jay, you know, because I write a lot for children, they're like, all your books are always, they always have to end in some sort of level of, some sort of strange sort of uh, uh, instance of hope. There has to be some sort of, some sort of hope at the end of your books because you're writing them for children or about children. And they see it as almost like hope, ending a book with some sort of hope is, is, is rudimentary or juvenile or like, but, but you do this. Over and over again, I find that your books always end leaving us with a glimmer of hope, no matter how complicated the stories may be, right? Knowing a per that, you are, that you run from cynicism based on what you told me uh, a year ago, a year and a half ago, um, can you just talk about what, what keeps you hopeful? Why you choose to sort of give a little bit of that at, at, always in the books? That, these books always, no matter what's going on, you're writing, and I don't know if that's just your stuff, like your stuff in the book, right? It always feels, it always feels good. It, for lack of a better word, it feels good. Like the, if anybody, some of you who have, for some reason I can't find my own language, but you know what I'm saying, if you read this book, if you read Dickie King Kong, it feels like you're at a show, right? You're reading the book like, yo, I feel like I'm in the middle of, this feels like a party, and there's people dying, there's all kinds of stuff going on, but this feels amazing, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> like, it almost feels like, it, it almost feels like I can tell that you are having a good time. Well, because I, I've, I've, you know, well, let me just, there's a poem that comes to mind. I believe the children are our future. Teach them well and let them lead the way. But no, <laughs> that's just from a, a corny song that Whitney Houston sang. <laughs> Look, you, you can't, why sit down and write if you're going to tell people what's wrong? We all know what's wrong. You walk out of here, you pull $100 out your pocket, and you walk down the street two blocks, somebody knock you over the head, it's over. I mean, you and I both know if it wasn't for our mothers, we'd be shaking a cup on Broadway somewhere, well, both of us. So we were raised with a sense of discipline and a hope that there is a God somewhere. And when you go to heaven, you know, you might be disappointed to find out he looks just like Rudy Giuliani or something. But you know. <laughs> but you know that somewhere up there, somewhere up there, somebody's looking out for us. Absolutely. Rudy Giuliani, with the hair or without the hair, I'm not sure. But I just couldn't resist being in Washington, D.C., I'm sorry. But why write books if you're going to say what's wrong? Because it makes you feel bad. I mean, I have a 2 o'clock in the morning tire mentality. If it's 2 o'clock in the morning and somebody pulls over to help me change my tire, or I do the same, I'm happy. And I believe that America is a two o'clock in the morning tired kind of place. Now, now we, you know, people have made a lot of money pumping us full of hate. You know, when you see about Rwanda or you read William Shira's The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, which everyone should read, you know what people are capable of. But the other part of that is that those of us who are like you and me, we're aiming for hope. We're aiming for it, and nothing's going to stop us. We don't yell and shout. We don't have AK-47s, and we're gonna they're not going to take my cigarettes. I don't care about that. We're aiming for And so people who aim for hope are like the people in church. They're like the two people out of the ten people in church who do everything. And those are the people that, they're like Cy Friend, the, the man who ran this camp, you know, who, who was, you know, nobody knows about him, but the people he touched. And his touch was the wonderful virus, wonderful, wonderful, good virus that spread, spreads over so that I'm talking about to him, to you, you know, talking about him to you right now. People who are cynical and say, why do you know? Because, they, they, you know, it's a way of covering their pain and absolving themselves of the responsibility of caring about other people. That's what they do. And so... I'm not interested in that kind of talk. It doesn't, it doesn't help me. I, I'm interested in solutions. And so, you know, you're a talented guy, man. I'm, I'm nice to hear you talk because it's very refreshing to hear that from a young writer. Um, That's it for me, folks. All right. <laughs> Y'all heard it. Let's open it up with some questions. <laughs> All right, it's on, it's on you. Well, first, it's a delight to hear you both in conversation together. I think that I speak for everybody here. It's wonderful to hear the two of you Thank together. You. So, Mr. McBride, you made it clear that this story has lived with you for a long time. So I was wondering why this story 
now? Why did this come out now? Why was this the story you needed to write now? And th my second question is, I have read the book, Mr. Reynolds. Um, there's a shocking tempo shift in the middle, and I was wondering why. Okay. Yeah. I, was, I was supposed to tell y'all one question, but these are two good questions. That's good. So here we are. Well, the, the, the answer to your first question is that it just, it, you know, I started this book many years ago, and it just, it just evolved at this time. Like I did the research for it while I was writing The Good Lord Bird and Deacon King Kong. You know, I'm always going places, going to historical societies and all over, you know, to get this information. So it just came together at this time. The second question was, you know, that was a hard, that was the hardest part of the book for me to write. You know, you know, people, you know, what we do with people when we place them in, out of sight. Um, I had to do it. I didn't like to do it. I, I contained it to like you know, maybe two or three chapters. It had to be done, but I didn't want to do it too much because it's just, it was just, you give the bad news and that's it. Okay, uh, well, thank you both, both for being here. Um, Tony, I'm also an Ohioan, so I wanted to ask you about, okay, what's up? So I wanted to ask you about uh, your time spent at Oberlin and how that sort of developed you as a person. I mean, I, I, you know, it changed my life. And I, I strong, you know, Oberlin has been through a lot in recent years. It went through a very difficult lawsuit. I, I can't talk about the lawsuit, but I can tell you this. I used to go to Mr. Gibson's donut store. And I went in there a couple times, never went back. I don't know many black students who went to Mr. Gibson's donut store. Mr. Gibson let you know right away he, wouldn't, he didn't like you. He was an old-fashioned guy. There were other old-fashioned merchants in town. And you went to them, and they were cool. They were old-fashioned, and they, you know, but they weren't like Mr. Gibson. So I just thought, but I don't want Oberlin to have to pay any more money that they've already paid. But I, it changed my life. I think liberal arts education is absolutely crucial to the development of a young mind. Absolutely crucial. So it, it, you know, I, I owe the school a lot. Hi, um, I want to add my thanks to both of you for this conversation. And uh, Mr. McBride, I wanted to ask you about, about the good Lord Bird and um, why you portrayed Frederick Douglass the way you did. Why did I? Portray Frederick Douglass the way you did. Well, um, that's a very good question. <laughs> um, it, because it really happened. Well, it really, it, Frederick Douglass really, he did have a mistress, mm -hmm. a white mistress and a black wife. Right. Um, he really, he, he did refuse to go with John Brown when John Brown right. went on his raid, which I wouldn't have, which I would have refused as well. Right. right. Um, <laughs> but... The book was really about John Brown. I mean, right. listen, there are many good books about it. Frederick Douglass has told his story very well, and he's a great, he was, remains one of the great figures in American history. But it was a book of caricature, and I just couldn't resist, okay. you know, poking a few, you know, poking fun at Frederick Douglass, but I didn't mean to harm his reputation or anything oh, no. like that. <laughs> Thank you. I promise you, you did not harm his reputation. <laughs> I love listening to you talk about your character development and you know, writing the names, everything. Um, something that in all the books of yours that I've read, I always notice there's a nugget that pops up in one chapter and then a little bit later and then a little bit later. For example, in Deacon King Kong with Mr. Rogers and 143 and what that meant. And so I've wondered, do you, as you're doing your research, do you find little nuggets of things and keep them in a file and just wait until you're working on a, a book and say, oh, wait, that would go really well with that character? Or do you, or does it, do these nuggets just come to you as you're writing the character? Does no, I, 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 keep a, I keep a little red notebook with me wherever I go. I got, you know, piles and piles, and I'm always looking for stuff. I keep in it, and, you know, Sometimes they, they pop in my mind. Other times I have to go back in my little books and see what, I can, what, can, you, what can be used. The smallest details, you always want to tell the smallest story as possible. So yeah, I, that, I don't have a file, but I have a lot of little books that I keep that information in. Thank you. Uh, thank you both for being here today. I wanted to ask what gives you the courage to write and reveal very personal aspects of your identity and kind of open yourself up to those uh, criticisms potentially. I mean, hmm, it's a very difficult question. I'm not sure. 
<laughs> so ridiculous. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, uh, <laughs> strip tape my clothes. Uh, no, I mean, uh, when I wrote my first book, you know, my, my agent sitting here, so I can't be, you know, I can't. I mean, look, when I wrote The Color of Water, I really didn't know what I was doing. I just, you know, I, I'd been a journalist for nine years, and then I was a musician for nine years. And during that musician period, you know, I was getting in vans and going out, playing in Gary, Indiana, and coming back to New York. And after I ate at the truck stops and had hamburgers, and I'd have five dollars in my pocket. I just got tired of living like that. And, you know, at some point it occurred to me that my mother was a unique person. I just wrote the book. I didn't realize that I'd have to go around and talk about it. <laughs> That's the truth. And then when I realized I had to go around and talk about it, I just got comfortable with the idea of just bearing myself because what is there to hide? Yeah. So that's, that's the answer to your question. Oh, thank you for this wonderful evening. <clears throat> I haven't read your book yet, but I suspect I'm going to find myself in it, the bedrock of my life, because I'm from Pottstown, Pennsylvania. Wow. Very good. Very good. <clears throat> so my question will deal with explicit bias, but before I get there, if you could bear with me, there's so many stories I'd love to share with you. Uh, Pottstown, was, for me, was Firestone, Kiwi Shoe Polish, Mrs. Smith Pies. Right. But I knew about Chicken Hill. I went to Pottstown High School. I lived on High Street, and my, my mother and father, uh, we, we lived in a railroad apartment, second floor, poor, lower income. And we had Ethel come to our house from Chicken Hill because my parents both worked full time. And I fell in love with Ethel and when she, when she died. It was devastating. And also, I worked at Penhurst, my mother also, and saw children institutionalized who shouldn't have been. Uh, so when I say a bedrock, it was uh, not only Sunnybrook and all the jazz where pe my mother and dad would go dancing. It was this intense experience of trying to understand their bias because they were afraid of Chicken Hill, right? So when they were older, I moved them to Maryland to subsidize housing. And their one request is they had to play bridge there. So I found them a place in, um, in Maryland where they could play bridge. And when I, the way I found it when I went in, these groups of black and Jewish people were playing bridge. And finally, my mother and father understood the other so they could let go of their fear. And they held the hand of some of those people so they died. So my question is a big one. I'm just leading up to it. You know, why Pottstown? Did you feel there was implicit bias there? What drew you there? What led you there? Because I can't wait to read the book. And this is my big question for many of us, I think. How do we throw off? Why does it take to be 80 or 90 to throw off implicit bias and the fear? Well, I mean, uh, Pottstown was just a mistake. I mean, actually, <laughs> I was really writing about Pottsville. Pottsville was too far west to get to. It is. They mix so them up. I was going out to Penhurst to, to you, know, you know, snoop around, and I saw a sign that said Pottstown. So I went to Pottstown. When I drove into town, I was, it was a beautiful town. It was a beautiful place. And um, if I was a young person, I'd live there. Beautiful houses, and, you know, it was cheap. And, and so I went to the Historical Society, and I went to the library, and I started doing some research into Pottstown. And I started talking to some of the black residents, and I learned all about Chicken Hill and the Jewish temple that was up there, and how in the 30s it was, there were only Jews and blacks and immigrants who couldn't afford, people couldn't afford to live in town, like you know, downtown on High Street, whatever, you know, on, on the good side of town where the bankers lived. So I just used it. And so a lot of the book is not accurate to history of the Pottstown you know. I just used it as a template to fill in these things. You know, Pottstown is, could have been, you know, it could have been in Maryland, it could have been outside of D.C., it could have been in Arkansas. It was just a place to show, and cause, because Pennsylvania but it had a high concentration of Im immigrants who came from New York, and a lot of the towns had small populations of Jews and, and other immigrants. And Pottstown happens to have Greeks, Mennonites, you know, they had, Pottstown had like 13 or 14 churches. So it had that whole Protestant, 
you know, Judea, Judea, Protestant Jewish thing together, and it was a perfect place to place the story. So when you read the book, you know, just know that it's that we're not talking about the Chicken Hill you know, but the Chicken Hill in my imagination. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Well, after listening to Helen's question, mine is so light. I'm happy for this evening of togetherness. And the last time I heard you spoke, Mr. McBride, was the night before the shutdown at Politics and Pros in Connecticut Avenue. I was so impressed that you kept your commitment. You followed through to speak there. And I do believe it wasn't like tonight's gathering. I believe I counted 28 people, and that included you. Well, yeah, that's right. Well, listen, when I first started out, I went to Chicago, and I read the two people, and they both fell asleep. So yeah, I remember, that was an improvement. I remember going there, doing the Barnes & Noble in Philadelphia, and one person showed up, and I took him out for a beer. <laughs> True story. True story. I said, we don't have to do this, brother. Okay. You lost money on that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for keeping that engagement at Politics and Pros. And I will say, since I enjoy listening to very intelligent souls like the two of you who happen to be writers, um, I, I kept that experience with me throughout the shutdown because it was hard not going out to hear people like yourselves speak. So thank you. Well, thank you very much. Be outside again. Hello. Um, I have a question about the good Lord bird. Okay. Why did you make Onion's character a boy that had to live as a girl? Because I didn't, I wanted to make, I didn't feel confident enough to write about life from the perspective of a, 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 an African-American girl in bondage. I just didn't feel like I could do it. You know, I just didn't, I mean, I, I just didn't feel confident enough to do it. And then when I came upon the idea, well, maybe if, you, if, if, if she is a he and just hides it, it, it makes for a lot of comedic, it gives you comedic territory. You know, he's planting that when you're doing a novel. You say, you know, how can I make this funny? How can I make it work later? So that's what happened. Thank you. We have time for everyone who's up here already. Please just be as succinct as you can in asking your question. Thank you. Thank you both for tonight, it's been great. I also worked at a camp for disabled kids and adults, so love to meet a fellow camp enthusiast. Um, I think for those of us that aren't disabled, our first reaction is to see disabled kids as weird or dangerous, which is obviously terrible, but the second reaction that I've seen a lot is to think of them then as precious angels, beacons of purity who are brought here to teach us a lesson. So is that balance, trying to find the humanity actually, something you reckoned with in writing this character? Um. Yeah, I mean, um, ultimately they're just kids, and um, once you ferret, you know, once you you, you you sort of fish through all the the stuff, you you get to these are just children, and but they have a special gift, and the gift is seen as a disability, but it's actually it's actually a gift, and it takes a while to it sometimes takes you years to figure that out, but yeah. Um. I love your characters and caricatures, and I find myself when I read your books, I just laugh the whole way through, even through like just terrible things. I'm like, oh my God, I'm a terrible person. I shouldn't be laughing at this. But it's just, you, you make things so lively, and, 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 and I just, I wonder, like, do you, do you ever miss your characters? Like, do you, like, in retrospect? Because I, I miss them all the time. Well, so. man, it's like, yeah, well, I, I, yeah, sometimes, yeah, I, like I miss Deacon King Kong, you know, I miss Sport Coat, you know, Sport Coat was fun to be around, and I, um, yeah, I, I miss, I miss old John Brown, you know, because he was, he was, he was just a pisser, and, uh, and I, I miss, in, in this book, I, I, I miss Chona, you know, Chona was, you know, Chona was a, a wonderful person to know, um, but you know, listen. You don't want to. You don't want to. You don't want to tell the same joke twice. You don't want to do a part two or you know redo. You know, color board a part seven. You know. So yeah, I do miss them though. Thank you. Where's my man? Sport coat. Yeah. I love it. Sport coat. Sport coat. Uh, thank you so much for both of your time. Uh, 
Mr. McBride, I remember you talking about how easy it is to make money off talking about our differences rather than our similarities. So I want to ask you, what do you think it will take for positivity to sell more than negativity? Positivity to? To sell more than negativity. Well, um, well first of all, it's nice to see a young man like you here. And um, I think part of it is you have to tune out people who make a living showing our differences. You just have to, you can't support those that are those people and uh, and then look to the ones who, who, tr who try to do the most creative things. You know, creativity really inspires positivity. Yeah. And that's really the, see, intellectuals like professors, and they always say, you're bad, 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 bad. Not, not that I'm against professors. I know there's right, 30 professors, 300 professors. It's not that. It's, you know, the problem is, the we know what the problems are. The problem, we know what the, let's just talk about solutions. So the creativity, that's why I talk about liberal arts education. Creativity is inspired by one's humanity. When Cy was running this camp, he had all kinds of problems. I mean, he had all kinds of problems. He would always come up with some solution that was just like, it was a Band-Aid solution, but it was so much fun to try to make it happen. So creativity is, is a key to, be, to working toward the positivity. You ever seen Ted Lasso? Who? <laughs> You ever seen the show Ted Lasso? No, I don't, I don't own a TV, so I don't. Oh, man. I, 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 I would applaud too, except all of you who've seen Ted Lasso knows it's a master class in okay. positivity okay. that actually works when it comes to storytelling. Fantastic. Watch Ted Lasso. Thank you. Um, I'm, uh, I'm an English teacher. Um, Jason Reynolds, my students love your books. Thank you very much. Yeah, so much. Um, and I was going to ask about anti-Semitism, but I'm not. Instead, you've written actually adaptations of like adult books. Sure. You've done graphic novels, and it's changed some of my students' like ideas of themselves. Have you ever thought about doing young adult versions of some of your books? They're so hopeful and so wonderful. No, I mean, thank you for, you know, saying that, but, you know, I've never even thought of that. I just, you know, I mean, uh, no, I'm just, uh, no, I never thought of that. <laughs> I think, but I, I do think that... He's I, already done it, and he did a great job. I wouldn't so. touch, I wouldn't touch it, but I, but I, but I, I wouldn't touch it, but I, but I do think that your work, because of the sort of visceral tone and the, the way that the words and the language and the characters sort of jump off the page, I actually do think they'd be amazing for 16-year-olds and 17. I think that people, my, I think my little brother at 17 would have eaten Deacon King Kong, and it's called Deacon King Kong. I think he'd have been like, this is amazing. And so I actually think that like those, of, those young folks who, who are on the level and who are ready to sort of wrestle with some of this stuff, I think, I think they work for everybody. Well, they have to be led to this stuff by teachers like you. Exactly. You know. Try it out. Try it out. All right. <laughs> All right, so I guess I'm last. Um, so what happened to the Christmas fund in um, Deacon King Kong? Because <laughs> I don't think that was ever really explained. <laughs> what happened to well, to be honest, I don't know. <laughs> no, I, you know, it was one of those, it was just a device. It was just a device, you know. Um, when you have a character, you, ha you know, you just dangle that out there for the reader and you let that roll. Um, look, I had a character, one of my books, the character died, and I forgot all about it. And then someone raised their hand and said, why did you, why did you let her die? I said, no, she didn't die. And then the lady said, <laughs> Right here on the page there, it says she's dead. What are you talking about? I just forgot, you know. But no, I don't know what, I, I really don't know. I, it, it just, it's the first time I ever thought of it. All right, all right, good enough. And oh, and just, I think Bo Jackson's a better example of a two-sport athlete. I, I would agree, I would agree. One man to take. I would agree, no, no argument from me, no, no argument from me. He wasn't, he, I, we'll have that conversation later. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I, uh, I want you all to put your hands together for the great, the legend himself.
Thank you. Thank you so much to James McBride and Jason Reynolds. All copies of the Heaven and Earth Grocery Store have been signed. If you'd like your name added to the book or if you have other books.